what is happening in all things digital assets, cryptocurrencies, NFTs, and alike. The market crashed. Is it all over now? I think uh, everyone who's interested to go down this rabbit hole will never come out again of it. You can easily launch a token over the weekend if you wanted to in ERC20. That's it's not a big deal. But to really find a mechanism that it actually has a value accrual in a tokenized economy is something very different. And this is something that we're seeing now with the next wave, really, of uh, developers and teams coming on that are now really questioning themselves, look, how can we actually marry these two topics? Plus, uh, one more thing, um, it's not just the sheer amount of money that's now like, being invested. It's also the sheer amount of know-how and uh, like people, like really, really smart people, moving into the um, web free space and like merging uh, web free more and more with traditional business models and with uh, traditional players the prediction I'm, I'm 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 a little bit shy on predicting values but we will definitely see huge value accruals and i also think that um, i mean bitcoin is the first asset in the store of value uh, but we will see big value accruals uh, with a lot of protocols um, and uh, much more interaction and new technology emerging. So we, we, I mean, we we touched this uh, the surface. I think um, from what's possible uh, with web uh, web free applications. So there's really, really, really a lot of room to grow here. Investing with experts is always the best idea when investing in new areas. This episode was recorded in February 2022, and I'm happy that I had the chance to speak with two experts in digital assets from my home country, Austria, Astrid Wollert and Christian Niedermüller. Astrid is the CIO of SMAPE Capital. Their slogan is, we invest beyond mission-driven tokenized economies. She's also working as an independent consultant in digitalization, digital business models, blockchain technology applications, and IP strategy. Previously, she was head of research at Cytel Ventures, a fund focusing on investments in distributed ledger technology, including blockchain. Astrid made her career in technology transfer, gaining extensive experience in identifying, establishing, and running startups. She has worked for world-renowned institutions such as the Institute of Science and Technology in Austria, ISD Cube, the Oxford University, and St. George Medical University of London. Her focus is intellectual property and business strategy, including regulatory considerations and data protection issues. Astrid has worked predominantly in the life science industry, where she worked at large pharmaceutical companies, for example, Böhringer Ingelheim, smaller biotech startups like BioVertis and Clinical Labs. She holds a PhD in plant sciences, cell biology from the University of Oxford, and a master's degree in microbiology and genetics from the University of Austria. Christian Niedermüller has been 15 plus years in banking and traditional finance in very challenging roles, but finally went full-time into the DLT blockchain and digital asset universe after being six plus years massively involved anyway. He is a co-founder and board member of the Digital Asset Association Austria and co-founder of two companies in the digital asset space, namely Smape Capital and DAIC Capital. In addition to all of the above, he is as well a serial pre-seed and seed VC investor in equity and token and a passionate footballer and skier. SMAPE is a team of seasoned investors and industry thought leaders investing in internet native ecosystems that are built by value-driven founders, obsessively solving fundamental problems by shaping the future of doing business. In this episode, we are talking about SMAPE Capital, Satoshi Nakamoto, NFTs, DAOs, the metaverse, and much, much more. I hope you enjoy this episode the same way as I did. I remember very well the mesmerizing price prophecies in November 2021. I think uh, it was Bitcoin should be around 200,000 euros first quarter 2022. 
And um, if I remember it right, Ethereum was predicted to hit about uh, 20,000 euros also in quarter one. 2022. And when I look on the uh, markets today, I think we are nowhere close to that uh, situation. The question I have is, uh, is there still uh, some room for cryptocurrency digital assets to grow or is it all over right now? And I'm happy to have in this podcast recording today, Astrid Wollert and Christian Niedermüller from, um, yeah, I hope I spelled the name right, uh, Smape Capital. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Good to see you. Start, let's start with the name of your company, Smape Capital. Did they spell it right? And what does it mean? <laughs> yes, you spell it correctly, right? It means uh, Smape uh, stands for Smart Perspectives, as mm -hmm. our first fund, Smart Perspectives uh, one. And yeah, uh, should mean that uh, we we are aiming to give uh, uh, new perspectives and smarter perspectives on the whole token economy. Economy and um, yeah, that's that's why we're here. That's what we stand for. A new innovative way to look at um, at the new ecosystem um, that is arising here. What's the focus of your fund? So basically, we invest in pre-seed, seed stage ventures in the blockchain ecosystem. So we are um, a token first fund. So we're predominantly interested in really the token instrument. Uh, having said that, uh, there are some jurisdictions where for regulatory reasons, we would need to go into equity investments to then get the token. But uh, in general, this is sort of um, the area that uh, we're looking at. And uh, in terms of infrastructures, we are very agnostic. So it could be any infrastructure that is out there because we believe that every um, infrastructure, maybe Ethereum or Polkadot or Cosmos or whatever, will have their own prime use cases uh, where they will work best. Um, and then they need to interact with each other. So this almost leads to the next uh, kind of sector we're looking at or uh, era, which is sort of interoperability and bridging solutions between these um, infrastructures to also make this vision of web free uh, reality. But we have also some other interesting sectors that we also see coming through uh, for our deal flow, for example, decentralized science or also the intersection of uh, hardware and IoT. Um, there are also, there's still a lot of opportunities also in decentralized finance and also the NFT market, um, whereas the uh, sort of applications of uh, for arts and collectibles has been hyped a lot. There's still a lot of room for other applications also in the gaming sector. Um, we've also done recent investment in, in, in that area, um, but also sort of like fractionalized ownership and the likes so, are also, in terms of sectors, we're, we're quite broad. That's that's good to hear. So you're the absolutely uh, right experts in the room to talk about uh, digital assets, digital economy. Uh, in January, ARC Fund published the latest Big Ideas report, and uh, the first time they came out with uh, price predictions uh, with a timestamp. Um, Kathy Wood estimates that Bitcoin could be $1.36 million by 2030. And her predictions for uh, Ethereum uh, is uh, 75 to 80 X uh, by 2030. When I translate it into the price, uh, I think we come somewhere between 150, 200,000. Um, the question I have to you too is, uh, we are, did all this hype come from? I mean, cryptocurrency, digital assets are relatively new. Can you give a little bit of an overview of the history of digital assets? Yeah, basically, interestingly, um, it's it's not as new as people uh, might want to think or a blockchain uh, concept as such. It's actually started as an academic uh, concept in the 80s. So David Chom actually uh, completed his PhD thesis as a uh, first academic in this field. And from them on, further developments took place until sort of Bitcoin uh, that was created by this um, pseudonymous uh, uh, developer, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, was put into life as first commercial application, you can say, of this technology. Um, it was, do, do you do you know who Satoshi is? Do you have a, have a guess? This is, I think this is one of the mysteries uh, around that. <laughs> I hear a lot of rumors. I hear mm -hmm. a lot of rumors, but uh, no, I don't know. No. 
But um, I feel like this will always remain a mystery. And if it's really one person or a group of people mm. and, and the like. But uh, I heard a lot of interesting rumors around that. Yeah. What was, uh, what was, what was the novelty? I think it was 2008, eight nine when they published the paper. What was the novelty in there? Well, basically that you would have this decentralized payment system and that you have uh, sort of this uh, token, this Bitcoin, uh, that you can use also to uh, re uh, transact between uh, people in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion without any intermediaries. So that was uh, really the novelty there. And uh, that was already, you know, a great achievement that we could do that. But it's sort of the real interesting uh, part came when Ethereum actually came to life in around 2014, 15, uh, around that time when uh, smart contracts actually were introduced on this sort of chain of blocks where you could then sort of run your own programs on each block and which gave rise to, again, yet more business models. And um, sort of then, then we could really see an explosion of decentralized applications being built on this uh, network. And soon from then on came then the question, well, how should all these chains then sort of interact with each other? And then there were uh, several efforts to build interoperability protocols. The so first one was actually uh, Cosmos um, that uh, launched uh, in 2016, I believe. And after that, we had other uh, infrastructures like Avalanche and Polkadot, which um, uh, tried to tackle this sort of uh, interoperability between chains. It's still within their own kind of hubs, so we're still a bit far away from having actually transaction between for sort of different uh, infrastructures. And depending on, you know, what infrastructure you have and how it's set up, it's uh, more or less easy. Um, but that's basically where we are these days. So. There is also this... Um this term next generation tokens that I heard lately. Um, what do you see as the next generation token? I mean, there was Bitcoin, Ethereum, and what's what's the next wave that's coming? I mean, I think that is that uh, not quite sure if one can say next generation tokens, but maybe next generation uh, or next next sort of innovations in this field is mm -hmm. sort of the, uh, as a, this interoperability between uh, those so called interoperability hubs, so bridges. And uh, making sure that uh, we can actually not only transact tokens, but actually also data between these. And um, I mean, there are always, you know, some kind of new tokens that are being born out, like, I don't know, social tokens, for example, for influencers or, or the like. You know, the NFT standard has been there for quite a while, but only has sort of risen to fame last year for, uh, um, for digital arts and collectibles. But I need to say, I, I wonder, you know, what more innovation is there for the blockchain field as, as a whole? So not just thinking about tokens, but what could actually still come after that? Um, unfortunately, I also don't have really an answer for that. But uh, my feeling says that uh, we there, there must be more to this technology than only the token, even though that's already a very significant development. But Christian, maybe you have some thoughts there as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so the main thought of what we, what we are seeing is definitely that there will be new like um, token types that have uh, additional attributes. Like Astrid mentioned, the social uh, social element. You you for example have now token variations uh, on the Ethereum blockchain, for example, where you have like an NFT where you can also like um, connect. Um, uh, payment streams to it, or uh, and and design a token in a very special way that uh, um, yeah, where you can more or less design a token as as you want it and have attributes uh, connected to it that make it much makes it much more flexible uh, in in the interaction for the user and for the creator actually of the token. Yeah, so that's that's definitely something that's going to happen. Yeah. That's very interesting. Can we uh, stay a little bit with this term that you mentioned, NFT? I think the first time I heard it was one or two years ago when Gary Vaynerchuk promoted it on, on social media. And uh, as far as I understood it, you can buy small pictures for a price that goes as high as $65 million. Uh, I think this was the work of Bieber's where he sold his NFT at that price. And when I look up NFTs, I always see some, some funny apes or something uh, that have a price of a at best of a few hundred euros um, and uh, also can go up to a few millions. And I always wonder myself, what can I do with that? I mean, it's a picture, it's on the internet. So well, what's behind this term NFT? Where do you see the use cases for it? I mean, it's the first time that you can actually own a digital object. I think this is what people always misunderstand because I always hear it sort of the thing that, 
Well, you can buy software, right? But no, you actually don't buy software and you don't own the software. You actually own a, own a license to a software or a digital object. And sort of with NFTs, you can really pin down the ownership. And this is sort of the novelty. And it's also quite uh, interesting what it uh, creates in the legal space, because now you can sort of reuse digital content um sort of um, have sort of like secondhand uh, JPEGs or whatever. And sort of uh, it also means... What really stands behind an NFT and uh, what kind of legal framework do you need to still create in order to um, yeah, make this really workable for people? Because that I think there's still a lot of illegal uncertainty what, what an NFT represents in the real world as opposed to sort of the crypto native people. Maybe one more one more element from my side. So, I mean, in general, anyone who is not very deep in the topic sees an NFT mostly as a picture or as an art object, which is like, um, as you, you, you've heard in, in some of the side comments from Astrid, which is, is not actually the case. It's a non-fungible token and you can, um, it's actually much more than uh, uh, an entry gate to a picture. It can be an entry gate to almost everything because it's really non-fungible. So it's only exists once so it's like it could be an entry ticket and uh, a lot of it can have a lot of other uh, elements as a um, as a something that is uh, unique and uh, if you hold it you get access or you access it not just to an digital object but can be as well to uh, concerts to all sorts of stuff to revenue streams to um, yeah it entitled can entitle you to something so it's a it's a it's actually a, a token variation um, a special one, and uh, we will see much more variations of this token variation of a non fungible token and many, many use cases. So the pictures were the first use case, yeah. And a rather funny one, I think. Uh, while you were speaking, I had the thought, can you, I mean, can we go back to the old share system? I think, uh, before the internet appeared, um, uh, shares or equity was basically printed paper, so could also a share be represented online? as an NFT and uh, being tradable then and uh, being made unique? Is that possible? So, I mean, a, a share is um, a share is not an NFT because it's not, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's like a money, you know, it's, it's fungible. Mm -hmm. And um, 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 yeah, I mean, like tokenized equity, we definitely, we already see that like tokenized um, ownership. Yeah. Uh, so fungible token as ownership is no problem. This will like be uh, in the mass market pretty soon. Yeah. Um, um, so that's, but that's not like an, an NFT, but um, like if it's connected to a special like piece uh, or to special access or a right, then, then we definitely will see, we'll see NFTs, but they are tokenized equities or, or shares. That's it's not a deal. I think it's rather uh, in this whole context of, um, ownership of organizations um, and and rights associated with it. It's actually uh, the the new revolution. There is 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 called the, the DAO revolution. I would say so. Mm -hmm. The decentralized autonomous organizations we are seeing, which is a whole new type of um, a, a whole new organization form and a whole new way of organizing, like fractional ownership. And fractional participation, um, and which is really, really interesting and uh, can uh, revolutionize a lot, actually. Yeah. You um, uh, have a great uh, overview of the market. Uh, what is your history with the, with the crypto market? When was uh, the first time that you got aware that uh, there is something coming uh, that has a potential to change our reality? How did you start, Christian, in the crypto asset market? Yeah, um, I, I would I would let Astrid start because she's uh, she started earlier with crypto. I mean, I'm also already six years in, in crypto digital assets, but Astrid even started earlier. So her her story is even uh, more uh, fascinating, and then I can I will chip in. Oh, good. No, I mean for me it really started almost ten years ago uh, when one of my uh, friends and co students at uh, Oxford University suddenly changed his LinkedIn to saying like. Uh, chief operations officer something called ethereum and we're building this world computer and i feel like i mean i was um, already heavy into innovation management at that time and looking into sort of uh, alternative business models and new new technologies and uh, i also asked him so like uh, it sounds really cool but i actually don't understand a little bit about it can, can you tell me more about it 
And so over weeks and months, you know, we um, sat down for coffees and uh, he was explaining to me what uh, blockchain means and uh, where it could all go. And I thought it was really, really fascinating. Um, it took a while. There's still another two or three years where I felt like, okay, now I feel really solid with this and I trust this. And this is not just what people say, like it's for criminals, which is totally misunderstood because uh, there is no more open system than a blockchain system. Actually, you can really track and trace everything there. Um, but basically that, and that was really my, uh, my, my starting grounds there. And I was very fortunate to sort of uh, bump into Aaron and also Gavin was a co-founder of um, an Oxford startup at the time. So this is sort of uh, where I uh, knew those uh, two guys from and it was sort of really fascinating when they then uh, built together uh, the team to then uh, get Polkadot launched and uh, sort of uh, seeing what was lacking maybe in Ethereum at the time and what could be improved and where the whole vision needs to go. And uh, the rest is history. I was also advising a few projects in this space, which uh, again very very interesting, mostly in the energy space. And um, yeah, and most recently before Smape, I was also head of research and managing partner of another blockchain focused fund, which was Cytel Ventures. Um, but so, so so this this topic has followed me around for at least like ten years. Yes, but Christian, over to you. Yeah, so for me, it's, um, I mean, I'm a traditional finance guy and I've uh, been in, in a lot of uh, banks. Uh, and, uh, but at some point, I was also advising in short techs and, and, and fintechs um, on the startup range. And when you're like, I, I stumbled across Bitcoin and, and the other elements in 2015, so six, almost seven years ago. And I was really fascinated and hooked uh, by it right from the beginning. And I could not stop reading nonstop. I, I like, and I never stopped. So um, once I, I started in 2015 to read up on it and, 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 and go down this rabbit hole, I never stopped. I'm still uh, reading every, every day and learning every day. It's this concept of um, of Bitcoin and then Ethereum and 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 what's 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 to come and what's coming almost every day. And uh, this, this this range of innovation is is uncomparable. Yeah, and and especially if you're coming from a traditional finance side, where you see all the limits and like all the regulation, and then you see something developed on the greenfield uh, and where code is law. Yeah. This is just uh, really uh, fascinating and, and 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 struck me and uh, yeah I'm I'm so happy to uh, that I I found this 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 field yeah this is, uh, is fascinating and and maybe for myself I then was also um, setting up the fintech advisory board of the uh, Austrian finance ministry and uh, we there had a work work stream around token classification back in 2017 when the first real hype started. For the financial market authorities, and out of that, um, we spend out at the Digital Asset Association Austria, where I'm still a board member at. And next to Smape Capital, I also co-founded another uh, uh, entity in the space. So I'm also deeply rooted, um, yeah, in the space. So, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a, a part-time GP in the fund. Um, so we have two other full-time GPs next to Astrid, and currently I, I moved as a um, CEO. Um, into a into um, an exchange actually yeah so I'm I'm one hundred percent now in one hundred fifty percent in crypto and uh, digital assets yeah and I love it it's uh, it's awesome yeah yeah so, so, sounds sounds like that I mean uh, you you mentioned uh, that you have your fund then you're on the board of uh, what was the uh, advisory board to the the no the digital asset association Austria yeah. which, which is an NGO yeah there um. Yeah, I'm um, I'm a board member still. Yeah, um, and then, then then yeah. you also at an exchange, and then you have a, another entity. Uh, how many hours does your day have? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, m mostly fourteen to sixteen. Yeah, so that's um, yeah. I was I was yeah. thinking more about forty eight hours. So how how do you how how do you manage that that many tasks? It must be no, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I'm, I mean, I, Astrid knows me already very well. I have uh, I have to do lists for everything, and uh, I only uh, 
go sleep once the to do do's are, are done. <laughs> so that's, Astrid, that's can, you way. can you confirm that? <laughs> no, I need to say the whole team is always baffled uh, how uh, how Christian really manages, but really with high quality and dedication. So mm -hmm. it's, it's very impressive. Yeah, it's excellent time management. Absolutely. That is this is this is good to hear. I mean, it's uh, very interesting how the space evolved. When I think back before 2014, is what it was more considered the area of the nerds and who needs Bitcoin uh, for what is that? There were no use cases. 2017, I found also very interesting with uh, the the first type that was not driven by the finance sector. I mean, it was always uh, guessing that somebody on Wall Street or uh, another area would start investing in that, but it were basically the grandmothers that wanted to buy something, a little bit exaggerated, that wanted to buy something for private people, so not professionals, wanted to buy something for, for, for their friends or for the family to build wealth. And it was, in my opinion, also mostly driven in the last years by influencers on, uh, on the outset on YouTube and not so much by traditional big funds that I expected more to be the first movers like in other areas how do you see that uh, how this uh, how this hype evolved what was the what were the driving forces behind it so i mean maybe i start i'll switch i mean 27 27 i mean around bitcoin you always had hypes that's probably you also had already the first hype in 2013 actually mm -hmm. and uh and then again uh uh in yeah for sure the biggest hype the biggest first hype in 2017 were the biggest first mass, or let's call it not mass, but the uh, retailer, it was a retailer hype uh, evolving. But then we were still speaking about two, maximum two to three percent, you know, of, of the retail masses jumping onto this, this hype bandwagon. Uh, but now that's probably, um, there, there we know much, we, we know much more and we can share this. Now we see really, really huge, uh, fund investments. Yeah. It's not like, a little smaller fund. We, we see funds compiling of the magnitude of billions, like single funds, in what, uh, which are just like investing into blockchain and distributed ledger technology and, and token. So, and it's like really a massive industry. Almost all big fund managers jumped on the bandwagon, set up their own blockchain DLT funds. So, this is a will be a massive like um, um, development. Will enable a massive development. For the scene, for sure, um, also a lot of money will pour into uh, probably um, not the best project because there's just so much money out there now. So we will definitely see more bubbles coming. Yeah. So the um, the bubble 2017 and to some extent the bubble we have seen now around NFTs and DeFi, um, there will be bubbles and bubbles over uh, over again. But we also, if we remember ourselves about the the, the early 2000 uh, years when there was a big bubble around the web 2.0 here yeah, how it's now called yeah also great things emerged out of out of this bubble you know I mean uh, a lot of a lot of the projects vanished and are not there anymore but this was the uh, this bubble and the money pouring in was the start of uh, yeah of everything we're speaking now, about now yeah so yeah Astrid what's your opinion? Yeah, I think just as Christian said, I mean, I think these uh, cycles have been going on ever since uh, Bitcoin sort of uh, was brought to life. Um, but as I said, real innovation then came with Ethereum, where they also introduced these initial coin offerings. No one could have predicted, you know, that uh, what effect that would have had uh, on the market. Obviously, it went swiftly up and then uh, we entered the bear market quite soon thereafter. And since then, I think decentralized uh, finance which was sort of closer to maybe also what people can understand um, as, as a use case of this technology really sort of brought the next wave of uh, retail users also into the space coupled with uh, the follow-on hype with uh, the nfts that we saw in the beginning of 2021 where really a lot of institutions then also bought in um, we also had Tesla buying into Bitcoin and, um, you know, MicroStrategy buying in uh, and, uh, and other investment managers. And that sort of uh, gave uh, first time in a long time also uh, credibility to the technology that you can really do something with it, that it's not just, you know, some nerds sitting around, you know, doing something on the computer, exchanging this kind of 
digital assets, tokens, whatever you want to call it, but there, there are real commercial applications, real new business models that are coming out of it. So I'm totally convinced that this, um, this is also here to stay. So even though we see now, you know, market downturns and whatever, I mean, this is normal in tech development in any event, um, uh, this, you know, it will not vanish to zero. Yeah, it's a quite remarkable development when I think of uh, the first transaction for 10,000 Bitcoin a pizza, which uh, basically was back then uh, $45. Uh, and just imagining to owning 10,000 Bitcoin uh, at 2010 prices, uh, the uptake is quite impressive. And uh, what surprised me was that the retail investors were front running and not the finance experts. And Astrid, you mentioned that now business models and uh, use cases are coming more and more to the market. And Christian, also you said that uh, the uh, big funds are now moving in. Um, it's a remarkable development from being something that you exchange for fun to getting pizza. And on the other side now in 2022, I think I read uh, KPMG also starts putting Bitcoin into their balance sheet. Uh, it's really getting a professional touch now. You mentioned before, uh, let's dig a little bit into the business models and use cases. You mentioned before the term token economy, tokenized economy. Can you explain a little bit more what that means? So basically, when you have um, a decentralized network, um, you can uh, share value by your participation in this network. And if uh, the token utility, as we call it, is well set up and well thought through, you can also assume that actually the value accrual from this network, from the usage of this network, will also accrue to the token and this is sort of something that uh, stands out sort of from newer generations now of decentralized applications to earlier generations of decentralized applications that people are aware of it, that only using so sort of just transacting on a network like Ethereum, for example, or any other big infrastructure will not lead to value accrual in the token as such. It's still the market that sort of derives the price. But with new applications, this is um, this is now improving um, because now people are really uh, putting sort of mechanisms in place that uh, will uh, lead to this uh, or is leading to this uh, value accrual. And this is also something that we're uh, closely looking at in our fund due diligence that we're not just investing into tokens that are that can be bypassed that you don't really need in the network as such or don't really need for the blockchain. You always need to think about that a token is always a financial incentive layer on top of a blockchain. A blockchain could run on its own perfectly fine, doesn't need a token. And if you introduce a token, it really needs to make sense and must have a, a certain utility. That's quite interesting. What can we do in reality with this token, tokens, token economy? But what, what applications do exist today that are remarkable? Maybe I asked for there's some topics with a uh, headset. Maybe I, I jump in. Uh, I mean, they're, they're like we, are, we, we, for example, it's maybe we're really looking at the uh, token utility, as you said. So um, it's really important because there are rather a lot of useless uh, token projects out there where the token has no actual use. Yeah. But um, there are like so many really great use cases. Speaking about, for example, decentralized autonomous organizations, it's a little bit comparable to share. Yeah? You have voting rights. You can influence whether what actually the project is, is doing with with, with the, the sheer amount of, of tokens you're holding. So also you have the voting rights. You're voting on chain. So it's also everything is very transparent. And so this is, for example, one really good token use case. Yeah. Then um, with all sorts of utility tokens, um, and depending on, and that's the freedom. And that's the great thing about it. You can design it as you want. Yeah. Um, you can you, you have, for example, token um, associated to platforms where the token gives you a discount, gives you all the voting rights, gives you um, um, yeah um, additional um, elements on the platform. The more tokens you're holding, the more uh, like rights you're having, and the more participation rights. So um, those are those are definitely inter very interesting utilities of. Of a token, and Astrid, I'm not sure if your headset is working again. Or maybe you can add here as well to token use cases. Oh, uh, totally. I mean, 
also again as, as, as you mentioned a sort of decentralized autonomous uh, organizations part the governance there is also very interesting to see you know how people really Im- implement governance how they incentivize governance as well um because that's also sort of a problem that we have in this space that or i mean not just in this space if we have you know any kind of political votes out there we we know what the vote turnout is and that's actually in and in, in web free infrastructure is actually even worse um in single single digit uh, percentage numbers so there are no more and more efforts also to sort of uh, uh incentivize governance and how we could uh, do that in in terms of uh, business models i mean we could also think for example the whole topic of the machine economy you know where then uh, suddenly the machines can also transact for themselves and become self sustainable business models so that i don't know excess energy for example can be traded um across parties so there's a lot of things that this technology can now bring to us and how you can actually use tokens and as you mentioned also before for example um there are also for example nfts where you could get certain rights to it get sort of a participation right in for example um again a machine an object or real estate object for example then get sort of uh, a, a, it's sort of something like a dividend for that so there are certain models that you can uh, employ with this technology and a lot of uh, sort of use cases that we also have never heard of haven't heard of yet yeah maybe the most prominent question one more thing the most prominent use case i mean it's obvious but uh, maybe some of uh, uh, our listeners are not aware of it so the most prominent use case is the transaction fee so if you are in this in the token ecosystem of the token you're paying with the token the transaction normally uh, and i mean uh, we've seen it with with these huge gas fees uh, with the overload of the and the really huge interest and in the applications building on the ethereum network um, the, like the transaction fees and the usage of Ethereum is increasing massively. And that's also, that's on the one hand, the usage of the token. And on the other hand, it's also um, the growing of the network importance and value accrual of, of the token in that respect. And I mean, that's, and that's, that's like, the, that's a network effect uh, and value accrual. It's a uh, yeah, very interesting element of uh, all over. Yeah. In, in, to add to what you said, in the last years, what I found remarkable is that, uh, especially in the last two years with the pandemic, that more and more retail investors, um, how should I call it, uh, start investing or gambling uh, on, on the stock market and are trying to find ways to invest the capital. And I think one problem always was for people who start out with zero net worth into their lives and don't inherit anything, um, that investing in equity and also investing in any other asset classes was rather expensive. But just think about real estate, you need a little bit of uh, of money already. And um, also buying equity, uh, Amazon, it's uh, 2,500. And I will think back, uh, students who don't have any money uh, can't afford such, such an asset. Is there any possibility uh, to use tokens or this to- token economy uh, to help retail investors getting access to more asset classes? Yeah, maybe maybe I start because I think this is really one of the most important elements actually of of, of blockchain in general. It's the accessibility to everyone, so everyone has the more or less the same accessibility to the market. Um, with traditional capital markets, as you know, the accessibility is sometimes very limited. Sometimes from emerging market countries, they can't invest easily into into traditional equity markets just simply because brokers. And marketplaces are, are missing, and that's something that's fundamentally changing with um, decentralized finance and, and applications on the blockchain. Because anyone um, who uh, gets the seed phrase or uh, like uh, gets the uh, gets a wallet and um, has has an internet connection actually can interact with with blockchains, transact, and sometimes for really, really, really low fees. Yeah. And and what we are seeing, and, and that comes then to your to your question is, and we also invested in in one of those protocols, is that um, uh, we we see a lot of um, synthetic assets, so um, assets that get copied or they like um, the development gets copied, and then that enables, for example, someone from Bangladesh or uh, from uh, African countries to easily invest as well into uh, traditional equities or um, into and following them or following the the value accrual of those equities 
um, without uh, having the need to have uh, uh, access to uh, a proper broker or marketplace. So that's definitely happening. And there's a huge merge of traditional uh, equity markets and markets and um, and digital assets happening over the next couple of years. This is um, this is definitely just the beginning where we are right now. Yeah, maybe maybe just to add on that, it's still people should be aware of that it is still a high risk class, and that you should really you you need some technical sophistication also to understand what you're actually investing here. Uh, so that you're not just on sort of the, the mercy of influencers who build their own kind of narrative around the coin and might just push it up for, you know, not much utility or not much use uh, or not no, not much value otherwise behind. So I think this is something, it's something that also resounds, I think, in the traditional markets, do your own research. And that is really, really crucial and really important that don't invest into uh, something or an asset class that you do not understand. Very interesting point in that um, I am a huge fan of the capitalist meritocracy. So it basically, to me, it means uh, people who put in the work get something out of that. And uh, it works very well in several countries in the, uh, in the world. And uh, it's great to motivate people to move forward, to learn new things, to acquire new skills, and to do something of value to society. Uh, but it needs one precondition. Uh, it needs basically a bank account. I mean, when you want to transact these days, you need a credit card, you need a bank account, and then you can start a business and put a price tag on something and collect money. Um, and I thought uh, until 2021 that this problem of having a bank account is solved in the entire world. And I was very surprised last year when I came across the Unbanked podcast, where I thought, better do they name this podcast the Unbanked podcast and started researching and found out that um, globally about 1.7 billion adults remain unbanked and don't have access to a banking system. So leaving these people out of the capitalist world means uh, that they cannot benefit of that. How can blockchain solutions be of value here? Well, basically, anyone who has also an internet connection can actually set up a wallet uh, and then start, uh, you know, uh, filling that up with uh, the assets that um, he or she wants to have. I think what also stands out is that um, if you have your own wallet, so if you don't keep it on a centralized exchange, you actually have your own keys and you are the owner of your assets. And actually no one can take it away unless, you know, okay, hacks and all that, you know, that, that happens in every system. But uh, in principle, there's no single party that can say like, oh, we're going to freeze now your account, which has happened in the past uh, quite a number of times where people were standing in front of ATMs trying to withdraw their cash and were not able to do so. And this is sort of one of the nice things about um, a blockchain and sort of these digital assets that you are really in control, you are in charge. I mean, it sounds maybe a little bit frightening at the beginning that sort of you have your own responsibility. But uh, once you go down actually this path, you can see that uh, how many advantages it actually brings to you also as a user in any circumstances in your life. Yeah, and, uh, imagine imagine being from uh, Venezuela and um, you wanted to, or you, you wanted to get out of the country for economical reasons or political reasons, like two, three years ago, they, uh, they were taking taking your gold uh, you had with uh, with you at the border. Um, so, and and we've seen like gold grabbing uh, all all over the time in the history, um, like uh, in the, as well in the United States, for example. Yeah, and that's just some really valuable element of um, of of this technology that you can take it everywhere, as Astrid said. And um, at the border. It, they can't take it uh, from you. Yeah, you. You can put in your seed phrase again somewhere else and have access to, to your funds. That's really beautiful, yeah. I absolutely believe that, especially these days. I think we see that uh, investments in real estate are not safe. Uh, and you have a problem, you can't take an apartment with you if, if someone wants to normal use cases i mean i have uh, entrepreneurs here in austria who want to build the company in san francisco because there are more investors there um when they want to move uh, all the assets to san francisco they have to sell first everything put it in a bank account and uh, then start from scratch over there if 
Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies uh, have a tendency to be relatively stable compared to the inflation rate, for example, uh, in their value, then it's pretty easy. You put all your money in a wallet and then you can uh, move around everywhere in the world. And looking at countries, you mentioned Venezuela and I think also Romania and other countries had hyperinflation. So uh, these price fluctuations also in cryptocurrency are relatively harmless when I compare it to the inflation rates in countries uh, like uh, Venezuela. How do you see it, Christian? I mean, that was a picture perfect example. Um, if you see, a, if you look at the adoption rates actually of digital assets, cryptocurrency, you saw, for example, in Turkey a huge uptick uh, during the hyperinflation, um, and also in, in a lot of other countries, Argentina and and you, you name them, yeah, you see huge, huge adoption. Also in a lot of African countries. Um, a lot of uh, startups arising out of that. I mean, it's not just like safe money transfer and value conservation. It's also remittance, no, for those uh, for a lot of like emerging uh, development countries. Uh, because uh, yeah, it's it's still very much cheaper than uh, than using Western Union or other uh, providers, uh, and they they take. Uh, a big chunk of what you're what you're transferring uh, already and it takes uh it takes a lot of time and it is also associated with the risks i mean nothing is without risk also uh, crypto transfers are with risk but um it's it's at least um much cheaper and peer-to-peer -peer. so um yeah brings a lot of positive aspects as well to it but yeah we, we also there we see a, a merge happening you know like also the Classically, remittance companies, they're jumping on the bandwagon and, and are using this technology. And in the end, it also brings down the costs uh, of classic remittance uh, a lot. So, yeah, so the technology is on the one hand as a, as, uh, as a whole very positive and on the other hand also drives innovation in, in classical industries. Let's not forget to, that also we've got stable coins as well in, in the ecosystem. So it's not just sort of the high volatility kind of risk asset that, that we see and the tokens associated with that. But we also do have stable coins. Never mind, they're uh, getting grilled by regulators these days. And we will see how that will actually pan out. But uh, in general, this is also part of this technology that not everything has to be as volatile as Bitcoin or other assets as well. Yeah, when I remember my days in merchant acquisition at uh larger corporation or listed corporations transferring money was really expensive and uh, a process so 20 years ago or 30 years ago it uh, took a lot of time and effort and uh, parties in between and i think with uh, this token economy you have a chance to make it easier I, I was not aware until i read the report from kathy woods that this remittance network plays a major role can you explain a little bit more christian and astrid what what what, what is behind that you mentioned it already but can we dig a little bit deeper why there is such a huge opportunity there Yes, because it takes uh, it takes seconds and doesn't cost money. I mean, you, you said uh, the um, the pain of uh, transferring money is almost gone in traditional it's, it's not. So when I transfer uh, US dollars to the uh, United States, um, it costs a huge amount of money still and takes five, six days, uh, if not more. Do, 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 you, and, do, sorry, do, yeah. do, do you know what yeah. the price is currently for transactions uh, via the traditional banking system? It's um, so last time I so I'm, I'm doing regularly um, well, quite large transactions and we from SMAPE also did a couple of larger transactions. It's definitely in the almost in the percentage range. So of um, uh, so and and in and with a pretty fa pretty high base fee, you know. So mm -hmm. uh, at some point it's zero point five percent to transform from, uh, from the transferring uh, uh, transferred value, which is really really a lot. I remember. Uh, yeah, it's really a lot. Yeah, and and it takes a lot of time. You know, a lot of like intermediate. Yeah, five to six days. I mean, and with a stable coin, as Astrid mentioned, you can have this within seconds. Yeah, and and it's transparent. You see if it is if, it, if and when it has arrived, and you can see where it goes afterwards. So um, yeah, yeah. So I said, you you are the one in charge with, then for it, example, with transferring a stable coin. You 
you are signing it. I mean, you're also signing it on the bank account with your uh, with your code and stuff like that. But you don't see where it goes and how it goes. And in the, the blockchain, you see every detail. When it arrives, you can, I mean, seconds later, you can ping uh, your contact on the, the Telegram chat and say, okay, hey, the funds arrived. Can you confirm? Yeah, yes. And you, you're sending them the, the Ether scan, so the... Um, the uh, more or less where you, where you see the whole transaction and say, yeah, look, um, there, uh, there, there you go. It's there in your, on your wallet. Can you confirm? I mean, I can anyway see that it's there, but uh, can you confirm? That's, the, that's just a revolution. And all those uh, things associated with um, like anti -money, uh, with money laundering and stuff like that, that's always over and over again. Um, it's uh, it's re revised. You know, you saw this big, big, uh, uh, you know, like um, uh, where, where they tried to money launder a couple of billions recently. It was and they tried to go via privacy coins, via Monero, but it was all revealed. You know, so it's all it's it's so difficult. It's much more difficult to launder on uh, um, to launder money on the on the blockchain than with the traditional system. Yeah? So it's really difficult, and all the, the centralized players in the digital asset blockchain scene, they have the same uh, requirements from a KYC and AML perspective than uh, traditional players. I mean, onboarding on an exchange now, on a centralized exchange, takes longer and is, uh, uh, than, than with a bank. Yeah, So um, or, or at least the same uh, time. Yeah? So it's uh, it's um, very safe. And uh, um, yeah, so you, it's almost impossible to uh, launder money on the blockchain. Yeah. This was also a thought I had while you were speaking that uh, these money laundering uh, regulations that we have in Europe, um, that the blockchain must be actually a good thing because there's always a question when I collect money as a company, where does it come from? And uh, when everything is recorded on the blockchain and they can trace it back, where does the counterparty got the money from? And they can uh, explain it clearly with uh, showing the data around the blockchain, where it comes from, and that it's from a, let's call it safe source, then it must also be great for, for drawing up the balance sheet at the end and for any audit. Do you see that similar? Yes. And it, it's also, you know, um, once uh, a wallet or a coin um, interacted with something fraudulent, it can be... Um, it can be tainted, so it can be like it. Uh, the, you can make a mark on it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you, for example, try to onboard a tainted Bitcoin with uh, or send it to a uh, centralized exchange account, the the central the, the exchanges don't accept it anymore. The, so, the software at the, every every big exchange now is software that de detecting um, uh, wallets and transactions that come from. Um, uh, wallets or, or accounts that ever in, uh, interacted with um, with any kind of uh, malicious uh, fraudulent uh, uh, actions, and uh, so it's really, really, really hard. And from an accounting perspective, you're also completely right. Yeah, I mean, there's software now. You just like um, interact with APIs, uh, so you connect your APIs from your wallets uh, and from your so from the exchanges and your your wallet uh, address. With, with software solutions and it, it extracts everything and you know, puts out a report uh, anytime uh, about um, about your transactions, your potential tax burden, and so on and so forth. So this all, yeah, it's actually blockchain is also a dream for um, uh, for for the for secret service and stuff like that because everything is is fully transparent once you know like. Uh, to whom a wallet concerns, to whom, um, then it's 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 very easy to it's like a um, yeah, it's very easy. So once someone knows your wallet address, they can also track you and and uh, see what you are, uh, what and how and when you're transferring what to which other wallet. Yeah. Yeah, but also as you mentioned, I mean, uh, these kind of tainted coins when they hit sort of also centralized exchange, they have the power to actually freeze those assets and uh, potentially also return it to the original wallet holder no matter if you know the identity or not but that's a good thing and uh, for example also recently was in the media that even through sophisticated methods um, a journalist in the u.s actually was able to sort of follow the traces of one of the major hacks this happened very early on in the theorem history a DAO hack um, where, again, huge sums of money were um, sort of um, 
drained out of the the, the initial DAO uh, made up by the Jens brothers of uh, Slokit. And uh, she was able to sort of follow the trace and uh, propose uh, an, an individual that uh, may have uh, really uh, carried out this attack. So you can see even years and years and years later, you can still follow the trace through the blockchain system, which is actually quite powerful. It also has dangers. I can also speak about that. But obviously, uh, so, so for mass surveillance or, and all that, it's also really a good tool, so to say, unfortunately. But uh, there are also very good aspects uh, about it. Looking at it from the uh, accounting perspective, I think it's one of the greatest things ever because you can uh, be 100% transparent in any transaction. And I think this is uh, was always, when it comes to accounting, one of the problems that people tried to solve. And uh, as far as I understand your explanations, now with the blockchain technology, we have it for the first time that we really can put that to work. Um, I like the conversation because when I asked questions in 2017 uh, about potential use cases, uh, I didn't get any answers. And now when we are talking about how can we use blockchain technology, how can we use the tokens, uh, there are so many potential use cases out there uh, that really help to improve things in the world. I would like to switch to, to the next uh, buzzword that I read lately on the internet. And I think Mark Zuckerberg was one of uh, those people who pushed the term metaverse in the last couple of months. He also renamed Facebook to Meta. And uh, lately I saw on YouTube influencers who discussed uh, how Microsoft will uh, push Facebook and Meta out of the metaverse because they have the much better technology. Can you explain uh, or give some details to the role digital assets play in the metaverse and what the metaverse is all about? I mean, the metaverse as such is not a very new concept. It actually also doesn't come from blockchain. So it's actually something that comes from the augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality kind of worlds. Um, so it's been a concept that has been renamed over the years uh, a few times, but it's actually not nothing new and not, not, not as I said, something uh, that, that came out of blockchain. What blockchain can add to these digital worlds, though, is that it can, for example, um, uh, make items that you see there for like digital fashion, you know, or again, any kind of gamification elements. Uh, it can make... Uh, these things um, so that you can really own them, it, you can transfer the value and also across different ecosystems, depending again what kind of uh, chain you're using there and how it's set up. But basically, um, this is sort of where one of the applications of NFTs really strikes because so suddenly fashion designers can enter these kind of uh, virtual worlds can sell fashion. Uh, you can also have new business models like where to earn. Uh, so you can sort of uh, wear these digital garments and can get paid for being like a, for advertising uh, there. Um, so you can see that uh, it has sort of uh, enriched the whole AR, VR, XR uh, communities and the, the, the display. And this is certainly an area that I'm very much interested in and find it very exciting where this will actually still go in the next years and how um, we sort of will reinvent ourselves also in the whole discussion of digitalization and going deeper and deeper into these virtual worlds. I can uh, can see this, uh, this topic coming. I mean, uh, for the gaming industry, it must be a blessing. Um, just thinking back to the 90s, uh, when the internet arrived, I think the first things that went online were shooter and also online role-playing games. And people always laughed, uh, those people who like to play games, always laughed uh, to put uh, to personalize their avatar so that it really looks unique to them. And the problem with that was you invest a lot of money uh, by basically collectibles that don't have any value. When I just think about uh, the trading card game Magic, which is also, I think it started 2000, which uh, also put an online version on that. And I loved playing this game uh, about 12, 13, 14 years ago. The problem also there was whenever I bought cards online, I mean, they did cost money, uh, similar to the real world version. 
but uh, I couldn't exchange them and uh, they were basically not unique. And now, as far as I understand uh, your explanations, Astrid and Christian, that the NFTs really have the first time the possibility to make every single digital item unique and uh, transferable. Is that the right understanding that I got? No, totally. I mean, there, and again, there's so many other applications that come uh, can out of it. So, for example, in gaming, as we rightly say, I mean, the the, the the nice thing about NFTs is that you can lend them out, for example. So you don't need to sort of spend, uh, I don't know, credible sums of money on an item that you would only use once in a game, but you can actually go to someone who would lend that to you for a much cheaper price. You just use it once, it's gone over, and then the the person gets it back and that's a sort of a nice uh, win-win situation for both sides but it's also taking it uh, to next level for example um there was just recently also an um sale of dogami which uh, sort of has virtual pets so virtual dogs basically and you can also breed them they will have certain traits and characters and depending on how you treat it like like, like again a tamagotchi but that some one that you can actually then sort of transfer between people and sort of give it your own kind of uh, special uh, attention and sort of this is what nfts also make possible so it's really exciting to see what will happen in the next few months in and that space as well yeah one, one, one comment from myself to that i also think the metaverse as astrid said was was already there beforehand but now and maybe that's the real metaverse definition we see like everything merging together in the virtual world value transfer uh, gaming uh, applications and when it all comes together like we will um I'm, I'm a bit actually that's the one thing i i i'm i'm not sure if i'm so comfortable with that we we will probably like we are now in video conferences, we will delve ourselves into into only or in more and more in virtual worlds, and I'm not sure how how this will will change us as a society. But um, yeah, let's see. I mean, it's, it's despite of that, it's it's very exciting. Also from a business model perspective, open so many new things we can't imagine right now that will uh, will come to life as a business model. I'm I'm so sure about that. Yeah. And uh, we will see so many business models we, we can't imagine right now. Looking at today's world, I think uh, the metaverse will be relatively harmless or these little <laughs> words. Uh, also, when I when I when I look back um, in the nineties, I mean, as you said, it was already there in the gaming industry. So EverQuest was one of those games where people needed to collaborate at scale. Uh, to solve problems, in-game problems, and uh, it helped. I think also evolve. Think. Uh, this headset industries, microphone industries. So we had TeamSpeak back then uh, to work together and collaborating in such an online game meant that you have to coordinate at least 60 to 100 people to achieve one goal. And from your explanations, Astrid, um, what I got is that uh, the, the reward when a larger group of uh, people solved a problem in a game was basically in-game items that were unique and only one player could take it. And uh, the problem with that was that to solve the next riddle or the next uh, problem, you needed uh, stuff from previous problems. And they were not transferable. And now with NFTs, I mean, you can lend them out. It's uh, it's paradise, basically, because gamers can really start creating an economy in game in such games and basically make money with that, which is not a bad thing, in my opinion. How do you see it, Astrid and Christian? Yeah, absolutely, totally. I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's certainly something that enriched the gaming landscape, so, so the NFTs, and I think we'll see more and more of these. So there are also now more uh, sort of triple A plus titles being built that will come out in the next years that will be even more sophisticated than sort of the basic kind of games that we see today. But um, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity there. The thing with opportunities is always um, usually they need money uh, to to evolve. And uh, I see it in the life science industry, I'm not in the life science industry since 2006, uh, that money was always cars. And there were so many ideas, uh, ideas to move things forward. But uh, without capital, it's basically impossible. How do you see in 2022 the investment landscape in uh, all kinds of digital assets, private and publicly? How did that evolve and what is the future of that? Yeah, maybe I start. I mean, we already stressed it beforehand. I mean, this developed so significantly over the last 
two to three years, especially. And um, we see a lot of institutional players, um, uh, like, for example, Sequoia and others, um, building their own blockchain distributed ledger uh, investment teams as well on the equity as on the on the token side and just a lot of know-how is, is being built up within uh, like investment firms um, especially on the venture capital side yeah you you see because it's still uh, very risky to um, invest into early, very early projects and protocols teams but there's so much like know-how is being built so many people are uh, pouring in and that's all and, and, so, and that's why so many ideas are happening and that's why yeah the, and ideas and great people great ideas um great tech that's attracting money because uh, uh, they are at least on paper uh starting to sketch very interesting business models and interesting business models attract uh attracts a lot of money and yes that's that's why we see really i mean you can um you can we, we we get those reports uh, on a weekly basis um, how much money is being raised by by VCs and we are definitely on the smaller end with our twenty to thirty million we are we are raising. Um, there are funds raising in the in the billion figures, you know. Like and 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 who is investing in those funds? Big private equity firms, big uh, financial companies, uh, pension funds, and stuff like that. So actually, almost the the entire like value investment uh, uh, cycle is now somehow uh, starting to invest or is invested into funds and companies investing into digital assets and the digital ecos asset ecosystem, um, the blockchain ecosystem. So that's um, that's definitely happening. And this will, um, I think, only grow uh, much more from now onwards. But it definitely has arrived. It's um, being more and more institutionalized. That's that's good to hear. Uh, you mentioned that Sequoia is moving into that space, and I think the last fund that Sequoia closed was nine billion or something a couple of months ago. And um, Anthony Pompliano, is one of the influencers on on YouTube, mentioned that also BlackRock. He, uh, he titled this episode "BlackRock Wants to Own All Bitcoin in the World." Uh, that they are moving in. I just wondered. You said that you're raising a next fund. Is there still room for for other funds in that space, or is it already crowded? Yeah, there's definitely room. Um, you just need to find the niche and uh, a sweet spot. And um, Astrid already mentioned that our sweet spot is um, in the pre-seed seed space. And um, yeah, we, are, um, we have, uh, we have uh, a USP that uh, not many funds bring to the table. We are very strong on the legal and regulatory end. And with uh, the entire team we are having, um, we also have a really good understanding of token utility because we are also along in the space. And tokenomics, we have a very large network and are hands-on at the beginning with with, uh, with with early projects. And yeah, there's for sure a space exactly for uh, for funds uh, like us. Yeah, there will be there are for sure copycats out there and uh, would not probably not doing proper due diligence and uh, throwing money uh, uh, to projects uh, without uh, doing it properly. But yeah, for for funds like us, there's definitely. A good, good room, and we are very confident that um, yes, we we will be able to to deploy our capital wisely and in a very good way, and and find um, exactly those projects that are in our sweet spot range, and that will add a lot of um, uh, value to uh, to our investors. Yeah. Astrid, do, Astrid, do you want to say something? <laughs> Um, so the last question I got before dropping out for internet reasons was um, about is there more room for uh, funds like ours or others? And it, is it definitely, I mean, we're still quite early, you know, in the adoption curve also. Um, so uh, totally. And the more, the better. We're also collaborating in a very friendly way with uh, most tier one and two, uh, two type uh, funds. Uh, and uh, we're all uh, trying to uh, get this technology um you know, to, to, to a level that where everyone will have access and where it also works in a way that, uh, you know, the whole Web3 was uh, envisioned. Um, so absolutely. But also, as Christian said, I think um, for someone who would like to invest into a fund, you also need to, again, do your own research and see, you know, okay, what is the capability of the team? What is the USB? What are the entry points? What kind of social networks do they bring uh, along? And how well, good is their technical understanding, especially when it comes to token utility, token economics? Because 
um, we're st- so early that you need a lot of expertise in assessing um, these types compared to, you know, any kind of other standard venture. Um, you mentioned that you raised 20 million. Did I hear that correctly? Christian? Yes, we, that's that, the that's target. So we are mm-hmm. currently in the midst of our fundraise and um, yeah, we um, we have now commitments for um 10 million plus so we still have we still have room um but yeah we already in a in a uh, in a stage where we are um once we finalized everything where we would be allowed to uh do a first closing uh already now um but for our fund the first closing will most likely happen between mid and, and end of april um probably early may so that's the time frame we we still can accept investors for the um for the first closing And then we probably do a second closing later this year. Yeah. Let, let me ask you one critical question. Uh, with 10 million open, I think you also address not only institutional investors, but also private investors, uh, business angels, high net worth individuals, uh, family offices that basically could, could invest. So you're not raising 100 billion or something, um, which narrows down the market. So you leave the market open for you. And I can imagine that someone out there uh, listened to Anthony Pompliano on, uh, on YouTube and saw these mesmerizing returns that Bitcoin created. And in the last 10 years, with, I think, a millions of percentage return in a couple of years, and also probably read Kathy Wood's report that states that Bitcoin has still room to grow and might come up with the question, why should I invest in a fund when I just need to buy Bitcoin? It's so easy uh, these days. What is the advantage of investing in you? On the one hand, you only get into pre-seed seed stage deals these days if you are actually an entity and can present yourself with a solid USP. So it's not like that, that you just wave with money around and, you know, uh, people just take it up. Because, again, there is so much money on the table these days that uh, projects are also very much looking for a value add in an investor. And there, luckily, where, uh, as Christian said, we have a quite unique USP where I think maybe just one other fund um is, is working on a similar kind of uh, uh angle uh, but uh, also if you consider the kind of valuations that you get in pre seed seed stage uh, rounds they're actually at the fraction of the listing price that you get i mean no matter what you can get good returns also by going to listed assets and it's always good to you know maybe combine these uh, strategies um, but in general, if there is really a downturn in the market, then from experience, uh, it is very rare uh, that uh, you would hit prices below those pre-seed seed stages. It can happen for various reasons. Also, when you know projects uh, may make uh, wrong decisions and strategy, and this is something that we're also trying to help with, um, sort of connecting them to the right market makers and, and so forth. So that, uh, that is also sort of in a safe and sound way. But there are many uh, sort of advantages for actually going into a fund that had, has access to these very early stage rounds. I absolutely believe that I also see it in the life science industry. Whenever I have an opportunity that I think is interesting, uh, the first calls are always to venture capitalists or to funds, uh, because I know that they also have the right network to help moving the assets forward. Um, and I'm very selective with that. And I'm pretty sure that in your area, it's pretty much the same, that interesting objects, interesting ideas, uh, teams that are proficient in developing certain ideas, um, first call funds in their space and see if they can get a deal closed and then go to other people. So this is a um, good reason to invest in you. And uh, coming from that angle, what is the focus of Smith Capital? What is your what is your core expertise of the team? What are you looking at in terms of uh, areas in the industry beyond pre-seed and seed stage? So basically the expertise in the team, is, as we said before, is uh, very heavy also on the legal and regulatory side. We, so we've got two advisors that are very well known in the crypto and regulatory and VC space in Germany, um, as well as a full-time GP that's still in stealth uh, for a month or so, um, that uh, works on legal and regulatory matters and that also sort of feeds into our own due diligence that we can uh, make sure that We only invest into business models or protocols that are 
regulatory sound at the stage of investing and considering all, you know, the kind of intel that we get from our network would also last for the next years. And uh, sort of we're also very strong on the token utility aspect, as we said. So really looking at, at where is the value accrual in the system? Um, is it really just purely a speculative token and we'll, we will likely pass if it's a really good token that shows value accrual through the usage of the network and uh, the utility, then this is something we will invest in. But other than that, we're very broad on sectors. So we said that in terms of DeFi, you know, the, we've had the hype. We have already a lot of platforms out there that um, are sort of uh, winning. It's really difficult to find new uh, you know, like a significant innovation in this space. We have done some investments in this space, but it certainly will not be a huge focus uh, of the fund. In the NFT space, we will not invest in NFTs per se, but in platforms that will actually um, build on uh, new functionalities and will uh, allow for new sectors to come up in that space. So this is something that we're certainly looking at as okay, digital fashion, digital lifestyle, um, the whole metaverse topic, fractionalized uh, ownership, also in terms of IP management, for example, so intellectual property management, I mean, with that. Um, we also have a lot of, uh, you know, interesting opportunities around data and AI when it comes to, for example, healthcare, decentralized science, also protocols interacting with hardware or IoT devices. So we will not invest in hardware per se, but it's, it's very capital intensive and will take a long time until... <laughs> It's actually uh, out there and certified and uh, meets those requirements because we also have a short uh, lifetime of the fund. It's five plus one plus one. So we need to make sure that uh, also the value accrual will actually happen in that time frame um, to make sense. And um, yeah, as also mentioned before, there's a lot of supporting infrastructure that uh, we still need to invest in bridges that uh, uh, work for interoperability between those kind of platforms. Distributed data storage, for example, is also still a topic that hasn't been solved at too well. There are some interesting infrastructures, but I think there's room for more. So, and all sorts of interesting new, so to say, like consumer facing applications. It's also a topic for us to get really also more Web2 users into Web3. Um, and there we're also, again, very critical also on the token utility side. We're coming to the last part of the inquisition. So uh, when you met, Christian, you mentioned before uh, the bubbles, the bubbles that happen sometimes on the stock market. And when I read through the internet, I always see uh, one story flow. So there's a bubble and then some coming people who uh, remind other people that the bubble at one point in time will burst and then it's all over. Everything is gone and uh, the market is dead and nothing happens anymore. Um, in your opinion, Christian and Astrid, what is the future of investments in digital assets? Is there still room to grow or uh, with the latest burst or micro burst of the bubble, is it all over now? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, uh, yeah, you're completely right. It's then, uh, it's then much, much quicker all over than, uh, than before. And, uh, a lot of people are, are getting then desperate pretty soon. It's the same on the stock market. But if you are long in, uh, as long as we are in the, in the game there, it's, um, it's, it's still, um, so we are very used to this narrative that has been uh, in cycles coming over and over again. So, uh, and to your question, I think there's so much room to grow. So it's not like, uh, yes, it will grow. It will grow massively. Like, um, I think the whole digital asset ecosystem will do a couple of hundred multiples. I'm, I'm pretty sure over the, um, over the next uh, decade. Uh, so this is not like, will, uh, will it grow? The power is, it will definitely grow. Um, there is now, I mean, but the, the, the next cycle that is fed, that is being fed right now will be much bigger than the, the current, the, the last or the most recent hype cycle because millions of projects are building now fed by a lot of money. And there, this will be, this will be uh, exponential. Yeah. The next, uh, the next, uh, growth cycle of, of blockchain digital asset of the digital asset space. Yeah. And, um, we can't, I think we can't even imagine. I think the, the prediction. I'm 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 a little bit shy on predicting values, 
but we will definitely see huge value accruals. And I also think that, um, I mean, Bitcoin is the first asset in the store of value, uh, but we will see big value accruals uh, with a lot of protocols um, and uh, much more interaction and new technology emerging. So we, we I mean, we, we touched this, uh, the surface, I think, um, from what's possible uh, with web, uh, web free applications. So there's really, really, really a lot of room to grow here. Yeah. yeah, I need to say it as just to also chipping. I think it's also often so when I hear the discussions of uh, Bitcoin is just falling in the same way like the stock market and actually very much coupled to uh, same sentiments and all that. I think it's also a misunderstanding of what tokens actually represent and also comes back to what I said quite at the beginning of the podcast that there are sort of these kind of earlier kind of uh, projects and tokens that have brought to life where, you know, it was, uh, you can easily launch a token over the weekend if you wanted to in ERC20, that's it's not a big deal. But to really find a mechanism that it actually has a value accrual in a tokenized economy is something very different. And this is something that we're seeing now with the next wave really of uh, developers and teams coming on that are now really questioning themselves, look, how can we actually marry these two topics? And so I, I totally believe that in the future, it will not be in a year or two, <laughs> we're just you know, setting the, the expectations right. But it is that these new approaches of token economies and how they are being built uh, will actually be much more stable than what we see on the, uh, the, the traditional markets because they will represent, you know, a participation in a network and they will represent the value of that network and will not be that much, um, let's say, prone to all side of all outside events that you have. So try to think of those tokens as sort of separate sets of, uh, I don't know, um, access rights to uh, to tokenized ecosystem that you can use them, for example, for your energy trading, for going for shopping for groceries or whatnot else, you know. So the, 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 the dynamics of that will fundamentally change. And this is something I think that people are still not considering uh, well enough these days of what it actually represents long term. Plus, one more thing: um, it's not just the sheer amount of money that's now like being invested. It's also the sheer amount of know-how and uh, like people, like really, really smart people, moving into the um, web free space and like merging uh, web free more and more with traditional business models and with uh, traditional players. That's just something that will also drive the adoption curve massively. And as as they said, also with our investment focus, um, uh, like uh, customer um, consumer applications, there will be more and more, and it will be easier and easier to interact with Web3. And um, yeah, this will will drive the next uh, huge wave uh, of adoption and of business models. And um, yeah, this this is we can't. We, we, I'm sure we can't imagine how big this. This will be, and but also again, you know, it will be at one point it will be hard to differentiate. Is it now Web three where I am, like, or is it Web two? Am I in the metaverse? Um, or so I think you can't say at one point in five to ten years. Okay, is it now the is it now the digital asset world growing, or is it the metaverse uh, world grow ecosystem growing? So I think this will will merge to some extent, and um, yeah, all, all will grow together. But the aspect of the digital and to the token economy will definitely be a, a core pillar of what's what's to come here. Yeah. I agree to that. Um, I'm coming from the financial world also, and um, in Cafe Boots report, you made an attempt with a team to estimate the growth potential, and I find it quite intriguing. Um, she says that um, when I remember it right on Coin Market Base. Um, the current value of all tokens is about one to two trillion dollars. Um, and in the report, she shows that uh, gold, for example, has a, a 10 trillion market capitalization, global equities above 100 trillion. Then she also puts uh, in the graphic uh, global M2 with 123 million, a trillion, or global bonds, similar size, or global real estate, 220 trillion which I think from the dynamic that you described in the token market, um, 
it gives a little bit of outlook what is still possible, what growth potential can happen over the coming years from one to two trillion up to probably when we compare it with real estates, 220 trillion. So money is flowing into that. And the government's also made sure in the last two years that enough capital is flowing through the economy currently. Um, Astrid, Christian, did I miss any questions that you would like me to ask at the end of the podcast? From my Sounds point of view, yeah, it was a really interesting conversation, yeah. and um, I hope you, um, um, your your listeners, will also like it. I think uh, everyone who's interested to go down this rabbit hole will never come out again of it. Uh, and I have seen this with so many people. Um, we start once started to uh, to read up and and actually practice and and and, and dig into the technology as well. Um, and um, you you, it's hard to go back or, or get out of it again. That's true. It's really, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, um, I mean, um, we we spoke a lot about the whole ecosystem, and I mean, uh, you anyway will will have our names displayed. So if you're interested to know more about uh, about uh, us and our fund, just uh, reach out to us, um, and uh, we can have bilateral talks as well about it. Yeah, we also have a very good blog, actually, that we're also trying to cover with uh, some thought leadership piece and educational materials. So most recent, we actually published also together with one of our technical advisors um, an article and an attempt to build a framework to assess uh, these DAOs, these decentralized autonomous organizations, taking uh, about 21 um, factors into uh, place. So. We will build some more articles around that and really try to propose um, a kind of valuation assessment framework for that as well. So uh, also follow us there and have read through it and always uh, we always welcome feedback, obviously. I'm at the end with my questions. Uh, Astrid, Christian, thank you very much for your time. And I wish you all the best for your future. And I believe uh, you will uh, contribute uh, in a great way to the token economy. Have a great Thank day. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye. Did you like the episode? Then please, please, please leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple and make sure that you like, comment, and share the YouTube episode. It helps that the algorithm delivers the episode to people who also benefit from it the same way than you did. Have a great day.